everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Aquanut podcast. This is actually going to be a two-part episode with Rob Lowry. I hope you enjoy. Hey, my name is Derek and welcome back to a, another podcast. Today, I've got Robert. Robert, would you mind introducing yourself? Good morning. My name is Robert Lowry. I've been in the pool industry for 46 years and I'm a chemist and I've owned two chemical companies and a publishing company and I've written 21 books on pool chemistry. <laughs> that is impressive. Well, we're going to get into some of those books because I'd like everyone to see those books and there's one in particular that I'd like for the viewers here to purchase and I'm going to put that in the link down in the uh, description area. But can you give us a little bit about your background? Kind of how did you get in this crazy industry we call the pool industry? Well, believe it or not, uh, when I finished college, I um, uh, got in the aquarium business. And okay. my roommate and I started making products, chemical products for aquaria. And uh, we had a, a product that was a clarifier for aquariums. Okay. And a bunch of guys that worked with us at the Center for Disease Control, um, we had a hunting group and we sit around the campfire at night and one of the guys was asked if we could use uh, this aquarium clarifier in his pool. And this was in 1973. Wow. And we said, wow, that could work in a pool, too. <laughs> and so we tried it out in his pool, and 46 years later, I'm still in the pool business. And I have developed 111 chemicals uh, in addition to owning two chemical companies. So um, I've been around in this industry for a very long time, and I've created a lot of products. And hopefully my one of my goals from the beginning was to give good chemical technical information to people that need it. And so a lot of my focus during my career has been on uh, service technicians that go out and service mostly residential pools, not big commercial pools, but you know regular backyard pools that people own. And um, they want to, uh, uh, some people want to wash their own cars and some people take it to the car wash. Some people have a service tech and some people want to do it themselves. So um, I've always tried to give a good, uh, honest, real factual scientific information uh, to the people that need it. But I've had a knack since I was a kid of being able to explain things to people so that they understand it. So I can take this technical, complex chemistry information and write it so that people can understand it and use it. Okay, excellent. And I, I purchased one of your books that we're gonna get into and it is very easy to read. Unlike some of the other chemistry books, whenever I got my certification, that was, uh, that was a difficult read, but yes. you read it and you learned it and you, you got all the, info that she needed to pass your test and I've uh, well I'm only 41 so I haven't been in it for as as long as you have but I have been a uh, a CPO for 15 years I I think it's hard to keep track of time I was a CPO instructor for 21 years oh so. wow <laughs> I was uh, I was just a little guy so uh, back back then let me ask you this kind of uh, random question. If you were a superhero, who would you be and why? <laughs> I have no idea. I, I was a superhero before I got in the pool industry. <laughs> <laughs> <All right. laughs> well, frankly, I say superhero. And the reason I say that is I was, um, I was in the Army before I went to college. And while I was in the Army, I was a Green Beret. Oh, wow. And as a Green Beret, I was a sniper. And so um, my expertise was that I could shoot a rifle really well. <laughs> and so I was uh, a superhero, and I was in, uh, 
in Vietnam for a couple of years. And then uh, I got out of Vietnam, went to college. Wow. Okay. So I was a super, superhero. <laughs> I did not know that. I, 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 I didn't know that. It's that. not something I tell too many people because I like to concentrate on my, my time in the pool industry and not my time when I was in the U.S. Army. All right. Well, we can edit that out if you... No, no, no. I'm fine with that. <laughs> okay. I'm good with that. What are you most excited about right now as far as the pool industry goes? Well, in the past couple of years, there's been a, a, a trend chemically that people are, the service techs are starting to follow and many stores are starting to follow. And it uses a chemical that's been around for, well, <laughs> technically it's been around forever <laughs> since dirt, right. but um, it's a chemical that's called borate. And technically when you put it in water, it is boron, the element boron. Okay. But um, it's referred to in the industry as borate. Mm -hmm. And this borate product is the same product, exactly the same product, that you put in your washing machine that's called borax. Mm -hmm. So you put it in your washing machine, it makes your wash white and, and makes your clothes cleaner and all those wonderful things. When you put it in a pool, it does two really great things. And one is that it... Um, prevents algae. It is not an algicide, but it prevents algae from starting once it's introduced. Okay. So it's what is technically called an algistat rather than an algicide. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that it does is it keeps the pH from going up. It doesn't prevent it, it just kind of slows down the rise. And it's called a buffer. So it's a pH buffer and we call it borate, and there's three chemicals that you can use. One has got 10 molecules of water with it, and one has five molecules of water with it, and one is an acid. So we have sodium tetraborate decahydrate, which is borax, sodium tetrahydrate pentahydrate, uh, which is the most common, and then there is boric acid. But once they're in water, they all do the same thing. And you only have to put them in the pool once. And this great thing, what it does is it, it helps people to use less chlorine because your chlorine won't have to be uh, working on preventing the algae. The borate's going to do that. So people have been experiencing a 30 to 50% reduction and the amount of chlorine they're using just by putting this chemical in the water. And, and this is a good thing. It saves on chemicals. There's less exposure. There's less, you know, chemicals to be produced. So, it, you know, it helps even the, you know, the, the carbon footprint thing. Right. You know, so it even, <laughs> it even helps that. <laughs> but nonetheless, um, it uses less chemical, less exposure for people to chlorine and so on. So it's a good thing. In addition, those people that have a saltwater pool, mm -hmm. um, which is a chlorine generator where you put salt into the pool and there's a device that's in the plumbing line that electrolytically converts salt into or chloride into chlorine. Mm -hmm. And it's the same chlorine that you go buy at the pool store. Mm -hmm. So it's a, a nice little device, but all it does is make chlorine. It doesn't take care of your pool, it just makes chlorine. But in any case, um, these devices, because of the, the process of producing chlorine, it raises the pH of pool water. And if you put borate in the pool, then the pH rise is a lot less and a lot slower. So it, it helps to maintain water balance, which helps to extend the life of the device and extend the life of the pool. Mm -hmm. So they're a good device to have. Borate is a good thing to put in there with it. And so I'm excited about this borate thing. And I even got a call um, a few months ago from one of the manufacturers of borate called me up and said, do you know why 
the sales of borate in California have increased by 250%. <laughs> and I said, yes, I do. And they said, why is that? And I said, I did that. <laughs> did he give you a commission? I wish they had, <laughs> yes. So, but anyway, um, they thanked me very much. <laughs> Asked me if there's anything they could do for me. <laughs> but um, it, it has to do with one of the books that I have written. And I wrote a book for service techs. And my goal was to make a book for service techs that explains how to take care of the chemistry mm -hmm. in a pool for all of their customers and to make it easy and to understand and easy to follow. And that book is called the, appropriately enough, it's called Pool Chemistry for Service Pros. Mm -hmm. And it's only 28 pages and it's loaded with with all kinds of graphics and things, but it presents a method to take care of a pool that incorporates using borate, but it also explains a very easy way to do what they're already doing, only give them a little more understanding of how it all fits together. Because we have a guideline in the pool industry that is too broad. And when you have a guideline that has a range that is so broad, you can end up being within the range and still have a problem. Right. And that, to me, is a problem. So uh, I have created, I've replaced the ranges with a system of targets. Okay. And so instead of keeping the pH between, say, 7.2 and 7.8 with an ideal range of 7.4 to 7.6, why don't we just have a target of 7.5? And that makes it real easy to understand that if the pH is 7.3, you know that it's too low. Mm -hmm. If we have a range that says minimum is 7.2 and ideal is 7.4 to 7.6 and, and maximum is 7.8, where is 7.3? It's on the lower it's, end of it. It's between minimum and ideal. So what does that mean? Right. Is that okay? Is it not okay? So that's the point is that, that in my opinion, if the target says 7.5, 7, 7.3 7, is low. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the range for the industry or the range that the pool stores use, 7.3 is okay. Mm -hmm. And so this becomes a problem because as a homeowner, or even a service tech, you can keep your pool within these ranges, which should be okay, but then you can have problems. Right. So if we have targets, then you know what to do. Everybody knows what to do if it's off target. It's either below it, above it, or on it. Right. So you know what to do and you know what to change before you even go to the pool store. That's the point. One of the... Um and you, you've touched on a lot of points that I, that I would like to hit on. One of the problems that, or questions that I get an awful lot of people asking online is, my pool is X, my pool is green, my pool is cloudy, my, my pool uh, is foamy, whatever. And they, they say that the chlorine is fine and the pH is fine, how do I fix it? And my response is always give me all of your exact numbers so I can fix it. Exactly. You just talked about a target for pH, but that's only part of the picture. You've got uh, where's your chlorine, where's your calcium, where's the alkaline in that in that pool. So where's every everything else? And that's all. That's all part of what you what you go over is exactly hitting all of those yes, targets. Yes, yes, and and so we explain that from from the beginning that that we 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 recognize that the ranges are too broad. And so we set up a target for each of the water conditions. Mm -hmm. And so we have a target for pH, for instance, of 7.5, a target for total alkalinity of 90. We have a target for calcium hardness of 350 if it's a plaster pool and 250 parts per million if it's a vinyl pool or acrylic or fiberglass or something other than plaster. 
I got you. Okay. Can I touch on that for a minute? Sure. I'm a homeowner. I just had a pool built and the pool builder built me a vinyl liner pool and told me when I go to the pool store to not buy any calcium because vinyl liners don't need calcium. Wrong. Why? Absolutely wrong. The, the, what we call water balance in a swimming pool originally was a, a system of determining if the water would be corrosive, balanced, or scale forming, okay? Scale forming means that calcium or magnesium comes out of the water and makes a deposit. Balanced, of course, means that there's nothing wrong. Corrosive means that you are dissolving either the pool or the metal in the pool, mm. which part of, part of the equipment and the heater and so on have metal in them, especially the heater because the heat heater header, which is the part where the flame burns underneath the water, the right. tubes, Can't is copper. Plastic. It's made of copper. There's actually 16 feet of copper in a heater. Right. And so um, there's lots of metal in there. And if the water's corrosive, it dissolves that metal. Mm -hmm. And then it, deposit, it puts the, the ions of that metal into the water. And when, it, when the water can no longer hold any more dissolved metal ions, it deposits them out as a stain or scale, as a stain on the pool. And so you get a turquoise stain, you get a green stain, and those are copper, you get a brown stain, it's iron. And so those, a copper, a nice copper stain that looks turquoise, that used to be your heater. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, at any rate, um, there is a way to predict if the water is corrosive, balanced, or scale forming. Mm -hmm. And it's a formula that was created by uh, Dr. Langelier in 1939 for boiler water. But nonetheless, um, his formulas and his information is still used today mm -hmm. with some uh, changes in how it's done because we have better technology now. Correct. So there's some changes to the original formula but there is a formula and some tables that you can look up, and you can put the information from pH, alkalinity, water hardness, TDS, and temperature into that formula. And the goal is when you get the formula to come to a zero. And if it, it can be as far as a negative 0.3 or a positive 0.5, so anywhere in that range, the water is considered balanced. Balanced. Negative values are corrosive. Positive values form scale. So we have a method of determining uh, or predicting if the water is going to be okay. Right. So the goal then is to balance the water. So if we take those values and plug them into that formula, we can do that. However, if we use targets that I have suggested, then the targets uh, are within the middle range of everything. So if you just follow the targets, you really don't need to use the saturation index to figure all that out. Right. You just follow what the targets say. And it doesn't matter what the vessel is that's holding the water. The vessel, it, it almost doesn't matter unless it's plastic. Yes, let me, let me finish what I guess I started sure. to say is that the, the original Langelier saturation index and the one that we use today is based upon what is called calcium saturation. Mm -hmm. And you have to have a minimum amount of calcium to be able to balance the water. And if you don't have that amount of calcium, then the pH and the alkalinity are changing every time anything is put in the pool, including people. So, so the pH and the alkalinity can be bouncing around all over the place because there's no calcium hardness. So when we teach this in our classes, we teach that the bare minimum of calcium that you need in any swimming pool is 150 parts per million of calcium. That's it. That's the bare minimum. And so you need that to be able to have 
any balance of water. Otherwise, you're going to have problems and never balance your pool. So you need that. We recommend 250 parts per million of calcium for anything other than a plaster pool. Okay, and the answer is because there is no plaster in the walls. Right. So we don't necessarily need that. But in a case of a plaster pool, we need 350 parts per million. And the, the real reason for that is because we don't want some of the calcium coming out of the plaster in the pool. And if we have 350 parts per million in the pool, there's not going to be any plaster coming out of the, there's not, no calcium coming out of the plaster to get in the water. We don't want it anymore in there. So that will keep it away. Excellent. Now, you just talked about salt systems and we, and we touched on that. Salt systems have been around for decades. Yet, I still get, and even last week, I, I had um, one of my customers that we've been cleaning his pool for a long time now, and he said, I'm having a salt system put on. I only need you guys to come by and scoop out the uh, leaves now. I don't need any more chemicals because a salt pool doesn't need chemicals. How do you, how do you answer that without sounding snide, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's probably a good word to use. I, um, what I like to tell people about a salt system, I know that when they read the advertising and they talk to the salespeople, it's buy this and you have no more problems in your pool and all you have to do is plug it in and you're all set to go. And, you know, those are salesmen and perhaps they should be you know, busy selling suede shoes or you know, <laughs> something like that. But um, in any case, uh, or maybe used cars, I don't know. <laughs> but in any case, the bottom line for me is that, that a salt system only replaces you having to go to the pool store and buy chlorine. That's all that it does. It does absolutely nothing else. So, and I, I explain things to people that way that, you know, I know that the salesman said you're going to not have any more trouble and so on. And the fact of the matter is, all it's going to do is keep you from having to go to the pool store or the big box store or whatever, buying some chlorine and putting it in your pool, whether it's tablets or liquid or whatever. It just saves you having to do that. In addition, a salt chlorine generator um, has its own little set of problems. Right. And, and it's not that they can't be overcome, it's just that you have to recognize that this is the way that it works. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest concerns that many people have is that the process of making uh, uh, chlorine electrolytically um, produces a high pH in the pool. And so you're going to have to add acid to compensate for that. And if you don't, you will get scale. Right. And one of the first places that scale forms in a pool is wherever there's heat. And believe it or not, a salt chlorine generator produces heat because it's got a positive and a negative uh, number of plates in there. You, you charge it with electricity, and there's water running through it, so it cools the plate. But, but frankly, it's making a lot of hot water right there. Yeah. And the hotter the water, calcium is the reverse of, of what you normally think of dissolving something like sugar. If you heat up iced tea, you can put more sugar in it. If you had calcium in there and you heat it up, the calcium will come out. Right. So, so in your heater and in the, the electrolytic generator, there is heat created. And the first place you're going to get calcium deposits are in the heater and, and, and in, the, in the electrolytic generator. And we see this a lot because the units to clean themselves they reverse the polarity, right. which means they switch positive for negative, and the thing and the electricity goes the opposite way. And when that does, the calcium that's attached to the anode, 
when you switch it to a, a cathode, it comes off, it sloughs off of that metal mm -hmm. and comes out into the pool or the spa as what we what looks like snowflakes, snowflakes. or dandruff. <laughs> and so it comes out into the pool and they go, oh my God, what is this stuff? And it's what used to be on your, your chlorine generator. Mm -hmm. And so uh, whenever there's scale on the chlorine generator, you reduce the life of the chlorine generator. Mm -hmm. And so uh, if you let it build up and it keeps building up, it will eventually short, just like anything that's electric, the two poles, the plates on those things are only, on some units, are only about an eighth of an inch apart. Right. And so if you get very much scale growing on it, it can actually grow enough scale where one plate will actually touch the other one, which is I the same thing it. as touching two wires together. It's a short. <laughs> right. And so when it shorts, you kill the cell. So, um, at any rate, they have a problem with, with, um, with getting scale on them. Mm -hmm. They have a problem because um, if you use too much of another chemical called cyanuric acid in the pool, you need to put in a little more uh, chlorine to keep the algae from growing. And in order to do that, you have to turn up the, the percentage of operation on the chlorine generator. So you have to run it longer. And all chlorine generators, the life expectancy of them is based on how long you run it. Right. So the less you run it, the longer it's gonna last. Mm -hmm. So anything we can do to reduce that uh, lengthens the life of the unit. Mm -hmm. So adding borate does that. Keeping the pH lower in the pool does that because uh, the pH is lower, the chlorine's more effective, you're not going to form any more scale on there, so it doesn't have to work as hard. My recommendation for anybody that has a salt system is that they have an um, e erosion feeder with it. And people look at me like I'm crazy. It's like, I already have this. Well, I mean, salt systems don't work in the wintertime. So when you're yes, the most of the salt systems, uh, when the water's less than 55 degrees, they don't work. Okay, that's another myth that I get hit with all the time. Um, you know, it's it's just one of those things where it, 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 it there's there's salt systems are good. Don't don't get me wrong, but people that are selling them and uh, they're they're not telling them that. They have to clean, which is what you just talked about, that scale forming, cleaning a salt cell about every six months. It depends on the, on the conditions and where you are. You right. know, Correct. The, uh, the incoming water, if it has low chlorine, low, I mean low, uh, low calcium hardness, low uh, total alkalinity, uh, and you keep it that way kind of in your pool, it doesn't need to be cleaned as often. But the higher the pH, the higher the alkalinity, the higher the calcium level, the more often it needs to be cleaned. We have, in some areas, because of, of the calcium level to begin with, uh, these units actually need to be cleaned every four to six weeks, not six months. So, um, and the polarity reversing thing is okay, but that's not cleaning it. Correct. And, and what happens with the units as well is, um, give you a logical piece of information, if you look at, at at the, the water line in your pool, mm -hmm. you sometimes see some scum or a bathtub ring around the pool. Mm -hmm. And that used to be, most of the time, sunblock and, and uh, you know, hair cream and lotion, I know you don't use those things, but <laughs> uh, makeup and soap and deodorant, those kinds of things, they're lighter than water, they make it to the surface and eventually make it to the walls mm -hmm. or the tile. And you can imagine then that the water that's sucked in to go through the chlorine generator, that we get some of that scum and soap and all of that stuff on the cell. Right. When we get that on the cell, polarity reversing does nothing for removing that. So that kind of deposits of that oil and, and grease and those kinds of things, uh, that gets on the cell and shortens the life and it doesn't make as much chlorine. 
So it needs to be cleaned, you know, in some cases, quite often if they've got a pool with a lot of, a lot of kids and a lot of people using sun, sunblock and, and creams and oils and stuff like that that gets on that, that chlorine generator. Okay. Now, from here, I want to talk about the book. Um, this is Easy Pool Chemistry, and you took from your pool pro books, if I'm understanding what you told me earlier, and you made a book specifically for homeowners. That's because correct. what you and I are talking about, and we're using terms that goes over a lot of people's heads, exactly. to, to be quite frank, because you know, you're a, you're a chemist, yeah. I've, I, I've been in the, in the pool industry a long time, so I understand what you're, what you're talking about, but the, uh, the brand new pool owner or the new pool pro that's just getting into the industry, just understanding this, this book is going to walk him through in a very basic way, uh, to explain everything that that you're saying so that he has a rudimentary understanding, he or she has a rudimentary understanding of pool chemistry. Well, not only that, but this is, in addition to it being a, an educational piece, it is also a method of taking care of your pool. Mm -hmm. So one of the, the problems that I noticed in the whole industry Mm -hmm. is that there are many things that you can buy that explain to you about chemistry or about how to use chemicals, but the problem is that they don't tell you how to do it. And, and what I mean is, if, if I say to you, I want you to keep two to four parts per million of chlorine in your pool at all times, how often are you going to check the the chlorine in your pool, and what are you going to check it with? So I told you what to do, but I didn't tell you how to do it. Mm -hmm. And so 40 years ago, I started writing articles, and what I did was I told people how to do it. And I told them what to do, and then turned around and told them how to do it. And so all of the other manufacturers just kept telling, even to this day, they tell you what to do. They don't tell you how to do it. Right. And so um, there's two things that were really important to me. And one is that I want to build a bigger industry. Okay, I want more pools. And, and there's only, to me, there's only one way to do that. And that is to have happy pool owners. Agreed. And you can advertise all you want to, but what we want to do is we want people to say, I have a pool, you ought to get one. Right. That's what I want. Okay. I'm jealous that way. I want a bigger pie. I want a bigger industry. And we're not going to make a bigger industry until we make pool chemistry easy. Right. Okay. And... And I think, frankly, some of the manufacturers in the pool industry have made a, what I consider a big mistake. And the big mistake is that they have made a product that is add, add A, B, and C, or add one, two, and three, or some system like that to where you, where they tell you it's easy, all you have to do is add A, B, and C to your pool. But the problem with that is that you have no idea what A, B, and C is. And if you go to a pool store and they test the water, they're in control of your pool. Because you test the water and you come up with the numbers and then you look at their system and it says A, B, and C. What do you do? So you feel like the pool store is in control of your pool. And you have to go there with the sample. They give you a prescription. You go buy it. You pay the money. And two weeks later, you're back because it didn't work. Or now you need something else. And so I wanted to create something where you could understand the chemistry, where you could figure out for yourself before you ever go to the pool store what you need. 
And frankly, if you follow what's in this book, you will only need to buy liquid chlorine or calcium hypochlorite, two kinds of chlorine. Um, you will need to buy some muriatic acid. You will need to buy some baking soda. And you'll need to buy some borate or borax. And frankly, that's all you need. You don't need to buy algicides. You don't need phosphate removers. You don't need clarifiers. You don't need to superchlorinate or shock your pool once a week. You don't need all of that stuff if you take care of the pool correctly. Thank you for bringing up that point because in full dis disclosure, I own a pool store. Unlike what you just mentioned where people come in and we test water weekly, they bring us a water sample. We try not to tell them A, B, and C. I follow the chemistry. I say your pH, your, your alk, your, your chlorine is this, this, and this. And a lot of times I am explaining the what's, what's going on, why it's going on. <clears throat> Most of the time it's because people aren't taking care of their pool and they're just ignoring it. And then how to fix it. And I like to educate. That is part of the reason for this podcast. We've got thousands of people watching this. I'm giving this information for free so that we can educate people. And I don't care whether they come into my store or they come into somebody else's store. I don't want them to buy more than what they need. They buy what they need. That's the idea. But and if they just let it go, then there's a lot of other stuff. Yes, and, and there's no question if you follow what's in this book and you take care of your pool by, by once, maybe twice a week doing a couple of tests, mm -hmm. then you'll have no problems with your pool. You won't need any other uh, specialty chemicals, mm -hmm. okay? So you won't need any of that. However, if you don't keep, keep up on taking care of your pool and testing the water and making this, the small additions weekly, you will get into trouble. And then you will need an algicide, a clarifier, a stain remover, whatever, because if you let it go, you'll have a problem. There's no question about it. No question. And so, so you will have a problem. And so if you follow it, it's easy to do. And what I say is, if you think of it as a visit to your pool, rather than a than a job or an errand or something that has to be done. You know, it's all in the, in the terminology. You know, if you call it, a, hey, I'm going to visit my pool for 10 minutes and check, the, check to make sure it's okay, it's cool. You know, but if you think of it as, oh, God, I got to go out and take care of the pool. What a, man, I hate it. You know, then you're going to hate it. I <laughs> hope that you don't have that, that uh, term trademark because I'm going to steal it and start using it whenever I'm talking to my customers. Visit your, your pool. It should not be a job. And I don't, and I don't want it to be a, a, a job. And going back to your, to your book, now I bought the, uh, the e-book on um, uh, Kindle. And yes. uh, to l let you know, I think I spent nine bucks on it. Yeah, you know, the, one of the things that I wanted to do with this book, in addition to making it understandable, easy, and something to follow, I made it so you can buy it without spending a lot of money. And people that I talked to said, you know, gee, this book ought to sell for twenty nine ninety five, and And yeah, it probably should, but less people will buy it when you do that. And so my goal is to get more people to follow a program that works. And so there's lots of, of drawings and cartoons, and part of it is to, to drive home an idea, and the other part of it is to make you remember it so you know what to do to your pool. And it also makes it remember it so you can remember what page it's on when you want to go look it up. And, and it's loaded with information. The same version of that book is this book, and it's written entirely differently. This book is technical, and I'm a chemist, and it's written with, you know, bam, here it is, chemical information. And this one's a little softer. Uh, I had a, a friend who's an editor help me. His name is Eric Herman. And he's been a writer and editor in the pool industry, I think, for about 40 years. And 
he just, um, he dialed it down and helped me to write it so that everybody can read that and understand it and follow it. And we just loaded it up. I loaded it up with a lot of photos and pictures and graphs and diagrams and, and stuff. And I even called myself on the cover, I called myself the water coach. And I chose those terms purposely because, <laughs> okay, I chose the term water coach because a coach brings you along until you can do it yourself. And that's the idea is that, that I don't want to replace, I don't want to be your, your guru, I want to be your coach. I want to coach you along, I want to teach you how to do it, and then you can do it yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's the point. And, and I want to make a bigger industry, and I want people to be a happy pool owner, and I want them to, to understand their pool. And there's too many people out there that go, oh, I just don't understand my pool. I'm confused. All I can do is take a water sample to the store and let them tell me what to do. And, and there's plenty of stores, let me tell you, that you walk in the front door with a water sample, they got some new fancy gadget that test the water in 30 seconds and, and hand you a prescription of stuff to do and you spend two or three hundred dollars and a week later, two weeks later, you're back in the store because you just don't understand what to do and you got a problem again. And so um, I think that, that you can do this. It's not, it's not difficult. It does require that you make the commitment that you need to go to your pool at least once a week, sometimes twice, but not more than that. And, and there's seven or eight things you can check in the water. But the fact of the matter is, there's only three things in the water that change very often. Mm -hmm. The rest of them don't change very often. Calcium in your water, where's it gonna change? Okay, there's no more calcium being put in your pool, so where's it gonna change, okay? Cyanuric acid, if you don't use trichlor or tablets of chlorine, you're not gonna have cyanuric acid building up. Right. The, the, so those two are out. Your total is all solids. We just want to know what that is. So you can't change that anyway. So there's, there's a number of things that we don't, that don't change at all. The biggest thing Correct. that changes are your chlorine level, your pH and your alkalinity. Those are the things that change constantly. Mm -hmm. And, and depending on how busy your pool is, you can check it once a week for chlorine and pH and alkalinity and you'll be fine. If you have a busy pool, you're using it every day, you got a lot of kids or something like that, uh, yeah, you may have to check it on Wednesday and Saturday, something like that, you know, a couple times a week, three days apart. Um, and if you keep doing that on a regular basis, everything is a minor adjustment. And that's the point. And understanding how much chlorine you need in your pool is a really important thing. And it's, the industry says that we need two to four parts per million of chlorine in the pool. And I have, in the last eight years, been recommending a different system for understanding how much chlorine you need in your pool. And that is, there is a chemical that we test for, and you may know it as a homeowner, that's called conditioner or stabilizer. The technical name is, it's called cyanuric acid, and we sometimes refer to it as just CYA, okay? Which some has another meaning in another context. But <laughs> cover your assets, right? Yes, yeah. absolutely. Okay, so in any case, um, cyanuric acid is a very large part of tablets of chlorine, mm -hmm. what we call trichlor. Mm -hmm. And they are the tablets that sit in the floater or sit in a chlorinator. And they are a little more than 50% cyanuric acid. Mm -hmm. And that cyanuric acid builds up in the pool. And when it does, it slows down chlorine. Slows down the killing power and how fast it kills. And therefore, we, I have been on a, a mission to get people to lower the cyanuric acid level in their pool. And part of the reason is from research that, that other scientists and I have done, we have found out that, that a huge majority of your chlorine is bound to that cyanuric acid. 
and not available now. It is available, but it's not available right now because it's bound to cyanuric acid. And there's a part of the chlorine that's unbound with cyanuric acid that's available to do things in the water, whether it's to oxidize stuff or kill things. And it's actually a small part that's available. And the more cyanuric acid in the water, the less chlorine that's available. So I want to keep the cyanuric acid level low so that more of the chlorine is available to keep the water safe. And so rather than use the traditional two to four parts per million of free chlorine, we have set a goal of making, if you use borate in the pool, because it's going to be helping by preventing uh, algae, you can actually use 5% of the cyanuric acid level as your free chlorine level. And it makes it easy to know exactly how much chlorine you need in your pool as a minimum. And, and because sometimes two parts per million of chlorine in your pool is not enough, depending on how much cyanuric acid you have. Well, that's all for this episode. I hope that you've enjoyed listening to it. Please tune in next week for part two of this awesome podcast with Rob Lowry. Thanks for watching.